Yo, what's up? Welcome to uh, the first video of this kind that I will make. So today I'm going to be basically interviewing or just basically like mini talk show podcast talking up with Nick Wu about the operator nerf. Unfortunately, I messed up in the first uh, eight or so minutes where my camera will be laggy, though it's nothing crazy. I basically just sit here and I fidget and do weird shit with my fingers when I listen to him talk and ask questions. So uh, hopefully you guys don't mind the lag. My apologies, of course, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. All right, yeah, so this is uh, the first time I actually do anything with the right employee. This is Nick Wu, the OG Sova, the legend that destroyed the CS guys in the Devs vs. CSGO ESPN tournament back in April. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell everyone exactly what it is you do. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. My name is uh, Nicholas Smith, uh, Nick Wu in game, or my gamer tag. Uh, I'm an associate game designer on Valorant, specifically for premium content. And uh, what I do mainly uh, is weapon balance um, for the live game, but also... Uh, design on weapons and, and for skins like that, sharing competitive integrity of gun skins. Awesome, yeah, so what we're talking about today, I want to ask you, uh, obviously I'll be asking about balancing, I'll definitely be asking about the operator. Um, so would you want to walk me through exactly what the balance changes plan for next week are? Yeah, sure, I can read it uh, line by line real quick here. Awesome. So um, we'll start with the operator. Uh, we increased the price from 4,500 to 5,000. Uh, we decreased scoped movement speed from 76% to 72% of total movement speed. We adjusted the weapon's dead zone uh, from 30% movement speed to 15% movement speed, meaning you become inaccurate sooner and you become more accurate later when you're attempting to stop. Uh, we reduced the firing rate from 0.75 to 0.6. Uh, and then we reduced the instant equip uh, time uh, from 0.3 to 0.5. And instant equips play after a jet a cloud burst, uh, a phoenix, um, curveball, or uh, plant diffuse cases um, where you've tapped where you've pla um, tapped the spike or mm -hmm. you yeah. tap planted the spike and you'll get back up. Um, and then the leg shot damage decreased from 127 to 120. Um, and another set of changes that impact the op, but also impact all guns, is that uh, we changed how we do jump land accuracy. Uh, so previously, um, when you jumped and landed, uh, you'd become inaccurate for a brief period of time, but that accuracy gradually got better over the course of 0.2 seconds. Uh, we made it so now when you land, you'll be inaccurate for a slightly longer time, which is 0.225 seconds. But the difference, is, the difference is that you do not gradually get accurate anymore. You'll stay inaccurate for the full 0.225 seconds and then become accurate. So it's more of a binary system than a gradual or system. So it reduces the chances of being able to hit a lucky shot or a not perfect accurate shot. Yeah, most a lot of times in in most cases when people jump land and then start shooting like almost immediately, their accuracy was getting gradually good enough yeah. to like get more likely uh strong like good shots or decent good enough shots. Where in this case, where it's more binary, your likelihood of that happening is, is much lower, um, and that should also impact the op too. Uh, even though that jump land stuff is on all weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, yeah. so that's the kind of changes. Oh, sorry, so th those are the specific operator changes, right? And yes, sir. there's a bunch more. How much more is there? Those are all the op changes along with the jump change. So are there any other changes to character balance or anything that you would want to talk about too? Uh, as for the character balancing stuff, I think we have um, context around that we are um we have we're, we're working on characters and i think that those characters are always going to be a part of the equation um i'm a little less comfortable talking uh on behalf of the character team and what they want to represent of course. Um, yeah, yeah. so i could talk about the weapon i will say or i'm comfortable saying that like characters are going to be a part of the equation and how you um tackle an operator um and so i think that we are looking to have things with that looking to have changes with that in mind um how characters battle with that, uh, with the operator. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. You know, everyone talks about jet offing, uh, jet being very strong, being able to dash away from a shot and that. But let's let's just start with the operator uh, specifically, right? So every tech FPS that I know of, you know, has this expensive one shot, body shot, heavy sniper. Like every single game has it. And I think that balancing a weapon like that, especially in, in Valorant, must be pretty tough because you're treading a fine line of you want the weapon to be worth buying despite being expensive. And you want it to be viable to use. And you don't want it to be too overwhelming, but you don't want it to be too bad either. Because I was talking about this a bunch on my stream and on Twitter and stuff. And the best thing I could think of are 
you know, band-aid fixes, uh, temporary changes. You know, I definitely didn't really know. Usually I have ideas about balancing, but the op is one that I found super, super tough on. So like what goes through you and your team's head when you talk about specifically changing the operator and making sure that it's still viable in all levels of play? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that uh, for us in the team, for us, we definitely want to look at what um, what it's supposed to be good at and then do an analysis on like where all, where all the frustrating points are coming from and what's generally acceptable. Um, and I think cases in which an op is just holding an angle and your utility uses maybe wasn't as, as good as it could be or and it just like it kills you as you go dry or things like that. I think those are acceptable rules and those are frustrating, her, but I think those are acceptable more so than jump peak ops or, you know, fast repeaks and dash out and jet just like just holding whatever off angle that you can possibly like that you have a much harder time anticipating. Yeah. I think that those can get into the realm of um, feeling frustrating without any real obvious way of counterplay. Um, so I think that those uh, are the sort of things that we want to look at and take a deep dive on and see like where can we help uh, players understand what's going on or like see the potential in in counterplay versus just feeling like there's nothing to do um, or you know things that could be overly frustrating. So I think for that we've taken this. Um, we've taken this sort of approach where it feels more like the op is overperforming in offensive cases, in, in aggressive use cases, not even just specifically on jet, just in general. Um, and I'm sure, like, per character breakdown, it can get more egregious on jet and more egregious on, like, X character, right? But yeah. I think on average, it's just players have gotten really good at peaking with this weapon. And I think that it's overperforming in a way that's getting really frustrating. And it feels like there's not a lot you could do about it, or you could do everything that you thought was right and still just. Yeah. So yeah. you changed the op in multiple ways, right? And there are multiple problems. Do you think that these changes you're inputting now is more of a solution towards the problems right now? Or is this sort of a, See, you, you make these changes based on an assumption and you kind of want to see how people adjust to it before you and look to fur like make further changes in the future if that is necessary, right? So specifically for price cost, you know, do you target specific problems uh, and how the operator plays? Like a lot of people complain about double and triple off on defense. Is the price cost something that you specifically target, you know, that specific problem where there's a lot of ops, so you make it more expensive to make it less accessible for multiple people? Or do you just think that you want the gun to be played overall less, even in just similar solo op setups on defense and offense? Yeah, I think the price. Yeah, the price increase is definitely has um, its sort of merit on all of those all those uh, points where it's like it's harder to access for multiple people. Um, you know, it reduces the uh, just the just how late you might see the weapon. Like it, it makes pacing a little bit different. You will see it later in a in a given half versus um, how you might see it now, or more likely you might see more naked ops, and that's more of a there's a higher risk uh, than or a higher risk than what we currently have, where mm, yeah somebody can save on you know win round one, kind of do like a light buy or light buy round two and save a ghost or whatever, and then get an op by round three, but also have armor. Um, in this case, you're unlikely to do that, and so pricing is there to help uh, you know pace it out a little bit better and definitely give more of a risk reward to having the op and like either losing it to you know people who are on eco or something like that it should be more of an economic hit for sure um and so yeah just to play up that risk reward because it should be a high risk high reward weapon um and i think price helps us do that um i think price is also something that we can like change and people can get on board with a lot but a lot easier because it doesn't really impact like the feel of the weapon really um it, but it does. It gives us a great tuning lever to like show where where it could be in a game or where it should be in a game. Um, more often, like it should be showing up more often here, so we can check the price out. Or yeah, things yeah. like that. Um, so we can tune around that, and that's what's a really great thing about having having price. Um, and I would say that like uh, price is one of the most valuable sort of levers that we can tune. Uh, it's probably one that would probably change often, or it's like oh, you know. Um, it's not good. it's not a catch all solution though, but it is a good one to like keep changing. And I like don't know if we would be like, oh man, after this the op is still really broken. Like, oh, let's do six thousand. I don't think that would be the case. Uh, just because the max money is nine k, it just seems like it starts getting 
territory. Um, but I don't know, I'll never say never, but I, that that part seems likely. So I think we do have like bands on where we would want to move the price into. Um, but yeah, that that definitely helps out with where you when you might see the weapon and like in your overall decision making uh, when you're with a team and whether you want to and like if you lose that round and you give up two, that's like a hell of a lot of money down the drain. Yeah, you're gonna so have a hard time. I remember discussing this on stream too, where if you adjust the price of the operator too much, eventually you might have to adjust. How much money you get in overtime as well, which obviously affects more things than just the operator. Because if you go above five thousand, then you can't afford it in overtime anymore. You know, uh, would is that something that if the game needs that, if the if the weapon would need another price increase, would you also have to change those metrics for how much money you will get in overtime and stuff like that to make sure that the operator can still be used in those rounds? We would definitely make sure that uh, we we would take a pass at making sure whatever we want there to happen will happen. And I mm -hmm. I presume uh, since I don't know all of our like what we exactly yeah. want out of overtime in in, in that case uh, in that sense, uh, I would assume that like let's say we increase the price to you know fifty five hundred right. Um, my guess would be that we would just increase your overtime money to six thousand mm -hmm. in like is like a short term solution or like one that I'm just thinking of right now just so you can op an armor in a given round. Uh, or in a given OT round, or op and light armor, kind of like how like maybe today's world works. Yeah. But at the same time, like if we're increasing to five thousand now, um, I don't recall if we're making overtime changes right now for you to op and armor. So maybe you might have to go naked op and OTs yeah. in this patch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that for in my mind, I think we probably always allow you at the very least to buy an op, whether you get armor and utility, uh, is is unclear to me right now. Yeah. Um, but I think that we would definitely look at making these changes holistically and be like, okay, well, like now you just can't get an OT. Like that's probably a problem. But if you can get an OT, then I think it's like currently, right now, it's probably fine. Yeah, I think uh, so. Like course, that. Yeah. So in general, the changes you, you're making to the op, you would say that it's more about defining the op's strengths and putting it in the place where it should belong, rather than uh, putting it out. Like you obviously you want to watch a pro match. Someone has an op in the hand. You want them to be able to win a clutch if they're super skilled at it, right? So do you think that you are primarily focusing on putting the ops strengths where they belong rather than nerfing all of the outside situations to reduce the frustration? Is that with the, the jump changes and stuff, you know, obviously it will still be possible, but not as easy and definitely not as like fast and uh, not less risky, right? And the other changes, especially, you know, cost even helps with that where you buy the op, It'll cost more. You'll have less utility, maybe less armor. So you won't be able to use the op as often in the situations where you're entering with it, you're taking the first swing, you're going for aggro peaks with your own util, stuff like that, because you're going to have less access to it, right? So the balancing philosophy, would you agree, that is trying to right now focus on putting the op where it should be rather than punishing anyone that is trying to bring it outside of that specific area? Uh, I'd say that that's that that's pretty pretty close like we have this idea of the operator and what we want it to be and i think that we also as you said um we're not going to try to make the gun like non-viable in, in in offensive cases or in peaking scenarios right where you definitely want people who can be skilled within their given you know whatever given match that they're playing uh you know if they have the skill they can make the they can still make the aggressive play it's going to just give counterplay or an extra do, uh, extra added time of counterplay to the opponent and i think that does come in line to the philosophy of we want to make sure that we're playing to this weapon's strengths and making sure this weapon's strengths are intact and then uh her hitting it where we think the frustration lies and also where we think it can lose less power while still feeling like a viable gun still feeling like a good gun to use um in its in its attendant strengths is you know primarily like the best in class angle holding and i think that that'll still be the case here we've changed almost nothing about that basically um all target all changes have been targeted generally to like more offensive or overly offensive cases and i think that um that's generally what we're going to try to do with this weapon uh, uh, overall i think because like as you've said it can be very difficult to balance a weapon like this and i think that we need to always maintain uh, the sort of guiding light of what it should be good at and not try to take that away from it. And I think that that'll maintain its place in the game and maintain its, you know, its high profile. Uh, and I think, I, I'd still hope, and I think that 
if we saw that this wasn't the case where you can like never make any offensive plays with it, then I also think we would actually change that back and maybe revert some things or figure out something new to to give you some um some chance because I don't think it's reasonable to expect this is just like a turtle gun the entire time, right? Yeah, no, of course not. I mean you've seen Twitch, you've seen Wardell, you've seen the crazy plays he does in tournaments and in ranked and they're fun to watch. I think that definitely everything has to be in a spot where the guns that people enjoy using, the guns people enjoy watching, even if playing against them isn't as fun, I still like watching a really skilled operator, you know, use the gun. And you don't want to just completely limit what they can do to the point where they're forced to just play in one very dimensional play style, right? And I think it's super true to say, too, that when balancing a game like Valorant, um, you have your part in weapons, but obviously balancing something like an operator would be a breach buff, a phoenix nerf, or a jet nerf, and all these things that also apply to how powerful that op can be. But specifically for the weapon, you know, everything has to tie together in the end, but you can only talk about what you've done to the point where, about the gun, right? And uh, talking about the character picks and the abilities and nerfing and buffing other, you know, maybe introducing new characters and stuff like that will adjust how the game plays. So I think it's important to not make a decision too harsh or too too fast about a specific weapon because who knows maybe a gun that is bad now will be good in the future with a specific character it'll find its uses and stuff so obviously i've been very vocal about wanting an operator nerf i've been very vocal about wanting uh less of an op driven meta uh but i, I want to say i'm super happy about not just completely butchering a weapon regardless of like a uh, big community outrage because i think the changes you told me it's not pretty, pretty, pretty good. Uh, I think that it's super smart of you to make sure that the operator still has its place and kind of encouraging the use of that weapon in that area rather than just nerfing everything but targeting specific areas. It's actually super relieving to hear that those changes to the gun are specifically to make it better in its situations where it should be good and not try to make it worse in every situation period just because the gun might be... You know, if you look at... I'm sure if you look at just broad statistics right now, the weapon would look very, really powerful, just if you look at only that and not really about how people utilize it, how it plays, what characters are associated with it, and stuff like that. Um, but obviously, everything has to tie it together into a bigger picture. So when you think of dealing with a strong weapon like the Operator, do you also think about buffing other weapons or changing small things to other weapons like movement speed, acceleration, uh, being able to shoulder peek, stuff like that to punish an Operator more? Um, or do you try to just specifically focus on getting that specific gun in the place you want before you look at changing other things and because of how they might interact with each other? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you um, for thinking that they're smart changes. I appreciate that. No, they uh, smart. Like really they, smart. I like them. I um, love them. That's great. I hope everybody else does. Um, and to answer the question um, about, you know, when we make a change or when we look at something... Uh, I think for me personally, I think I like to, like, for for example, for this op thing, I think that, uh, you know, dived into it and thought a lot about just the weapon. I focus on the weapon, like, what it should be good at, and, you know, what uh, what is the frustration most people are, are coming to with it, and why is this happening? It's like that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that that eventually leads you down the road of how does this impact the other systems when you start doing things to the op, right? And I think that that was happening a lot like initially we started um not with this entire change list but we started with you know price uh, you know price increases and then i did like leg shot damage early on because i was like you know i feel like light armor is not valuable against the op because you just get one tap mm -hmm. what happened right um and so you know we started with that and we're like oh, okay well now like you know um we have the price increase and now it's really hard to get an op and there are some cases where like you know, when a team starts snowballing and you can't get the op out of their hands, it's like really hard for you to come back and get your own op, right? Um, and so, like, you have to start thinking about those things and whether you're okay with that. Um, and I think initially I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to just up the price and be like, it's harder to get, right? And yeah. then we start playing and then we start seeing that, like, oh, you know, it's like really hard to to break a team that has one if you can't, like, you can't even afford your own in a lot of cases. Um, and I think it's like, it comes down to a lot of conversations to talk with the team and like oh is that okay or not but it's something that comes up uh as you might not expect something that you might not expect uh when you're initially doing something so i think for me i look at something i try to do things that target what i want to do and then i'll 
find and see along with the team as we play test, like the sort of cascading effects or, you know, the things that change elsewhere. And if it makes sense, I think you would do something or you could make changes elsewhere to, you know, target what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I think that, like you said, if you, uh, you know, finding something is really cheap, but then the ways you would nerf it to make it not cheap hurt, hurt the field like dramatically, mm -hmm. then you probably go elsewhere. Like you buff breach flashes. Or yeah. X, Y, Z, right? Um, I think that that's definitely true in this case. A really nice collaborative effort on, on um, our team here where, you know, I'm really close with the character team and all the other teams to, you know, be talking about those sorts of things. Oh, what if you the X character do Y thing against the... Yeah. You know, I think that that, that all uh, can be pretty a pretty cohesive cohesive thing. And, but yeah, I think that you generally will... We, we would like to be, you know, as elegant as we can. And so sometimes that does mean we would change something that is like the natural counter to something um, if that's if that's not manifested properly. Yeah, I mean, as, a, as someone who cares a lot about balancing and overall game philosophy and stuff like that it's very easy for me to think of changes you can make but implementing those changes into a game shipping everything to live service and stuff is obviously a lot more than that especially because it's not just one person that's like decides if breach is going to get buffed or if phoenix is going to get nerfed if the vandal's going to get changed obviously it's a lot of communication between multiple teams um do you think it's true for you and your team about how you designed the gun to do something specific do you, did the community or any specific players like ever surprise you and do something that you just didn't expect to happen? Um, I would say that uh, the community, not necessarily particularly on the gun front, but I think that the community has surprised me in ways, in just general ways they've played. Um, I think the guns... Uh, People have found their ways of doing it, and I would say, like you said, Wardell mm -hmm. really brought out the character, brought out like this character and gun combination. Same with like Sinatra, and Sinatra, where they brought out Sova Odin. Really specializing or they brought that on to the, light. yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, which is something that we've like uh, we've thought about like internally uh, in some cases, like uh, you know these characters sort of uh, matchups with guns. But I think those players really like brought it out. Uh, to 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 the community and like really made it their own it's like almost their brain. just like if i like even if i'm if i'm on a set solo queue and like i'm not playing people are like a, you know because they they expect me to be like sinatra uh, <laughs> so yeah i think like that's been surprising at how um how married together certain characters are with their weapons yeah uh given how certain people have played with them i think so... that's been one of the most surprising for the playtesting, right? Obviously, the community knows that there's a lot of really skilled developers. There's on the on the game dev team. There's a lot of really really good Valorant players, right? But even though you guys are really skilled, obviously not everyone will come up with all the ideas. Where you release a game to millions, hundreds of thousands of people, like thousands playing in the higher ranks, right? So the playtesting when you're testing weapons, you know, do you kind of see that as a as an opportunity to just get the opinions of the people you're playing with or do you think that you're are you trying to simulate all the different ways that the community would react and adjust to a change or are you kind of you kind of focus on how do you adjust to the change what weaknesses can you find with the operator how do you play against it now in the play testing or do you guys really try to like focus on okay i use the op this way how would wardell use it how would sinatra use an odin when it gets nerfed or buffed right like how do you kind of approach that play testing uh i think for for us, there's definitely there's definitely a mixed mixed group of skill whenever we do need to play because we do need ten people. Yeah. Um, but that's not always that's not always so bad because I think you can get a good variety of perspectives because I definitely think we want to make the game good at all levels as best as we can, but we definitely want to make sure it works at the top level uh, of play. And so I think it's good to have some mix. And I think for me, uh, how we went about the operator and how. Um, I wanted it to be tested was a little bit of like, I want to see cases in which, uh, you know, a, a jet uses this and you're trying to play like Wendell um, versus, you know, just, I'm just any character and I'm just buying the op, right? And I think that that comes down to just general play testing. You can just be like, hey guys, try to focus on the op. And funny enough, sometimes it was hard to focus on the op because it was harder to buy in these play tests, right? Oh, that uh, makes sense, yeah. I think, um, 
we can we we leverage focus tests a lot for that focus tests are generally more are, are sharper for sure we're like we're just like give you an op and let's try to play around it and like those can be a little bit more contrived but they can be really helpful in like helping you gather some mm-hmm. data points or some feels around some uh, certain things you know and so it's like hey let's try jump op being here or let's try you know jet jump op dash out and see what's going on you just spend time um, on the servers kind of like simulating common scenarios that you would see in a match to make sure how it feels yeah yeah exactly and i think that um while for me personally it's not a good substitute for a live game because of the live game you know things happen you're thinking yeah. about a lot of different things you know that's going to be a truer um experience and like what is actually going to happen to a player but i think it can like narrow down and get you into uh the right ballpark or space to start thinking about, like yeah. what is the change actually Exactly. Uh, yeah. And that's like how that. we go about that. So um, I know and, in Riot yeah. Games, right, you have League of Legends and um a discussion that I talk about because I came from Overwatch and in League of Legends did similar things where a lot of players will kind of have their identities struck like directed to a character, right? Like someone will be a Riven main, someone will be a Renekton main. Like we have operator mains, even pro players that just completely excel at that weapon, right? So I'd imagine that you guys kind of put a lot of emphasis when you do make these balance changes. You can see that they're, they might be necessary. Do you focus very heavily on making sure that the gun still feels good to use and to make sure that the people that really kind of specialize in the specific weapons uh, can still use them? Or even though you, you want, obviously want everything to be viable to a certain degree. But how much of your effort goes into like, is there ever been a situation where You've had a simpler solution to this problem, but you had to go the harder way to make sure that everything feels good and to make sure that the people that, you know, want to only use the op or whatever gun you might be thinking of can still play that and, you know, not get flamed for it or still perform well if they just adjust to the changes, stuff like that. Do you ever want to opt for like that easier path if you've ever been there or is it always, you know, your top priority is to make sure that it feels good and it's still usable? I would say that after a time, that uh, at least in my in my more limited experience than probably some of my coworkers, um, I would say that I would often want to make the weapon still feel and retain a good feel um, as one of the top priorities uh, if we can get away with it. And I don't think we're there yet in a in situation, at least on weapons, where we need to make it like make a gun feel like complete ass mm-hmm. to put it into uh, its quote unquote place. Um, but I do think like feel is extremely important, and I think that sometimes you you you'll have to do that. Um, I'd imagine. I think that we we did have that a long time ago. For example, um, the op used to be a point three scope in time, or so it's point two right now. Um, and we had a lot of feedback, and I think it was even like that. I can't remember exactly when, but we had a lot of feedback that it was just like it was feeling like a slow gun. Like it, it just felt really slow. And in this case, it felt so bad that we had to we buff the feel of it. And like I think that right now, like that that sort of change got circulated within our our conversations. Like, oh, you know, what if we just change the scope and speed again? That hurts the offensive use cases. Like, mm-hmm. it does, it does, it really does. But it also hurts the feel. Like I think dramatically into what people are used to. So I didn't want to do that uh, personally, even though it can get you. I think it can get you a lot of the things that you know we're talking about in terms of desired behavior. Um, in terms of you know getting the op to be strong premier angle holding weapon, it's like the point three scope of time doesn't matter if you're just holding an angle, but it does hurt your offensive cases by like probably a dramatic amount. Yeah. Or if it doesn't hurt it as much as you want, it hurts that feel so bad that p- these people start feeling like God, I just got screwed by these patches. So originally, um, when you changed that scope in, was that only was that change only made to make sure that it felt better? You didn't consider you know obviously that was earlier in the game, right? It was a lot earlier in the game, but when you made the change initially, was that something that you made exclusively to make the gun feel better? Uh, it was made to feel better, but certainly we knew that it would have, like, power implications to the weapon. Yeah. Uh, and it's not strictly to be something that's, like, you know, quote-unquote quality of life. Uh, we knew it would be a power, like, a power increase, but also we... Uh, early on in the game's life cycle, um, if you remember from, like, like the Friends and Family days and stuff like that, or, like, the pre-alphas, um, the op was considered like a weak gun. Mm-hmm. And, oh yeah, even in like um, beta, it was considered a weak gun, and not yeah, much changed since beta. That, yeah, yeah, and not much changed. And then I think that um, even right before that, you know, we had that scope and speed, so we knew like internally it was seeming weak, and then like it was weak out there in the wild for a little bit until you know maybe more players got their hands on it and really unlocked the weapons uh, potential. Um, but yeah, I think that like that 
that change from scope and time, like that, that one's always the lever that we know is going to be powerful. In the way. Yeah. So it's definitely taken into account that like this improves feel, but also it improves power. And then uh, thusly it'll, you know, change perception playing as and against in some ways and ways that we can kind of quantify given our experience. Um, but yeah, you know, we definitely know that like, if you make any change that like improves feel, it can have a power implication. Well. Yeah. So when you make these changes to the weapon, right, is it a priority to make sure that the user of all scale levels will be able to buy the gun despite it being changed and just recognize that it's still the same weapon despite it being nerfed or buffed? Uh, that is the hope, yeah. The yeah. hope is to make sure that you don't dramatically change a weapon that like it becomes unfamiliar to its primary users, that's for sure. Just like I think when, um, if you played much League, I think when League does... Uh, visual gameplay updates, like complete reworks, they still want to maintain some identity of a yeah, character. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're not, uh, like, I'm not like, you know, wholesale, like reworking guns to be entirely new, right? But um, definitely when, when doing like a set of balance changes here, uh, we don't want the gun to feel foreign, you know? Yeah. Like, if I, if I, you know, I hope, my hope for sure is that, you know, this stuff goes out, Wardell picks up the op, he's like, okay, I see what's going on, I can get used to it. Yeah. Like, I understand what's still like feeling like, I could do these my my thing, but you know it might be a little bit harder, or like I gotta adjust a little bit, right? But I'd be I'd be a little bit sad if it's like oh this this thing is complete trash now, like I can't do I can't do, it, right? Yeah, I'd course. also be surprised if that was the case for sure. Yeah, I de uh, I definitely think with the changes you mentioned, I don't think that the operator will really be in a spot where it'll be endangered by any means. I think you know it's the only weapon that fills the role, and it's going to end up filling that role. It'll just be more of an investment, which is definitely. A good direction at this state of the game because as we mentioned the op was considered bad right in the beta everyone thought it was bad it was bad at retaking you weren't so good at quick scoping with it you couldn't really you couldn't really strafe with it as much but then after a while people got better they got better at jump scoping they just got more familiar with the weapon itself they knew kind of the positions to take and the angles to hold and the weapon started getting a lot better right without without any as far as i can recall even balance changes almost at all right so mm -hmm. do you think that the weapon has gotten to the point now where People have gotten good at the weapon, um, and the game is in a state where the weapon would need this nerf, or do you think that there's also the potential of you nerf this weapon a little bit, and over time, more people will get better at playing against an operator because you're getting more and more familiar with it. People are getting better at their characters, and people are getting better at, you know, baiting op shots and stuff like that. Did you want to wait longer, or was the waiting period, like, just, did you hit that point where, like, okay, this gun is definitely a little bit too strong in some situations? And people have gotten pretty good at using it, and people have gotten familiar with playing against it. Did you ever think that, or rather, do you ever think that you could not make all the changes you were thinking of, or kind of restrict how much you nerf or buff something by, because you want to see how the community reacts to playing against it with more time? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that that always like crosses my mind, and I think that, um, I think that even with these op changes, uh. I was a bit surprised, I guess. Um, I wasn't. I was. I was looking to make op changes, but I just. It kind of like the scope kind of kept getting bigger and bigger to me, I guess. And like I didn't initially set out to do this many things, but um, you know, we started adding to this this change list that we have, and then we got to a place where we felt pretty good about it. But um, for a long time, initially, I've always felt that like there's still more to learn against the weapon. Um, and I think that that's a fine line to that's the fine line to kind of toe where you want your you want your community to try their best to solve something um, that's within the game, especially something that you know it's you deem is like is a solvable problem and is like rewarding to solve, uh, which I can I think that the op is slash was um, I think it still will be, but I think there is a certain point where you know you come to a sort of crossroads is like well. Like there is a lot of outcry about this thing, um, and it's not it does not seem obvious to most people like what to do against this. Um, and you know, people are looking for something, some sort of help. Um, I think it gets into a weird space of, you know, oh, like I, I I want them to learn. I want them to like get to that like um, that that phase where you learn and how you how you deal with all these stuff, right? But at the same time, it's like. Are people like churning out? Are like they don't even know where to begin to start learning how to beat this thing? And I think that's been a, a difficult line to sort of toe and understand at times. And I think for us uh, and for myself personally, 
it got to a point where it was like, yeah, it seems like the op is really like getting under people's skins, and it's like doesn't seem like it's really easy to counterplay. It, whether we even use utility correctly or not, they just you know peek and get me or a variety of things. So I think that I would like to say that for me, I would like to see community over time i would like to see communities more over time see how they deal with things versus changing things as soon as we can um but uh i'm not gonna i don't don't represent the entire team's thoughts on that but i certainly have like been of that opinion where not necessarily that you should change things slowly but like be very intentional with what you do change and definitely take a strong look at what people are feeling or experiencing with this and seeing what um like if they are getting up and closer to that hill and overcoming that hill of getting past this like this weapon or this character or this map or whatever it might be. Yeah. I remember talking about um obviously I stream, so I get all sorts of people in my chat and I get my funny mm-hmm. side of people who complain about the offer weeks not why hasn't it been nerfed, right? And then we get the people like me. I, I'm also on the side where original of the off was looked at to be uh, weak and now it's very powerful. And I think that especially for a competitive game, it's very important, not just for the change you're making now, but for the change you might have to make in two years where you're consistent with you, you implement something, you give it time to develop, and you don't make any rash buffs or, or nerfs immediately, but you let the community try to like find you know, a characters, weapons, whatever might end up like being added to the game in the future, that you, you give the community time to find that weapon's place, right? And mm-hmm. I actually love that. Yeah, I mean, the past week of Ranked hasn't been fun for me because uh, I just don't enjoy <laughs> playing as ops, but it's really, really good to me that I, that communication about the dev dev team looking into the op is really good and the fact that it hasn't been you know rushed out on a change where there's a reddit post and immediately there's just oh we nerfed the gun right i think it's super good that the nerf or buffs that might come in the future are consistent where you give the community time you really look at things for what they are and you don't rush into anything just based on community feedback or pro players tweeting in all caps on twitter like me Right, I think it's super good that you're taking step by step and you're making sure, okay, we're looking at this, we hear you, and we're looking to make changes, we don't know what they are yet, because not rushing it is, I think, perfect. I mean, I completely agree with what you think. Obviously, your team is your team, and they have their own opinions too, but I'm really happy that, yeah, it's been a few shitty ranked games, but it's long-term super good that nothing is ever rushed, especially when balancing something like this, because there are quite literally careers on the line with uh, pro players really specializing in specific weapons or character combinations with weapons, right? And it's really nice knowing that, like, you acknowledge that. And I think also, obviously, do, how much of your weighting do you think you put into looking at... So there's this little disconnect where you can buy an op. Any character can buy an operator, and the weapon itself is as powerful as the weapon is, right? But dealing with the operator is going to be pretty commonly done with utility, right? But those are things you have to lock in before the game has started. So the, ma- the main way to deal with an operator holding an offensive angle will be with a specific character doing something, right? But if you lock in a composition before the game, you know, as before the game has started, and then you know, oh, we're playing against a really op-heavy team. How much of your balancing, like, philosophy into the specific weapon goes into thinking about, okay, this weapon can counter specific compositions. Do you want the operator to be sort of a tool that can be used to counter a team composition of characters that aren't necessarily the best at dealing with them? Or do you really just focus on making sure that no matter the composition played, you want the operator to just have an identity and a role that it can play and hopefully not go too far outside of that and be too dominant? Do you just really focus on the weapon? Or do you really consider, you know, I want this gun to be able to counter a team that doesn't have a Soba or that might not have flashes, etc. I think that uh, when it comes to weapon balance in itself, it's um a bit a bit harder to um or not necessarily harder but it's it's a a team composition is on such a grander scale that i think that it's probably only the op that really kind of gets into the area to me of you know where should this thing be like should it be good against xyz position right um because of how sharp its identity is uh in terms of like you know it's the it's the one shot kill gun, but it has this you know it has like even an even longer refire time now. So certain things are going to be much better against it, right? Such mm-hmm. as smoke uh, versus like a smoke is probably not nearly as good against Noted, um, especially in like an open field or like an open site. Yeah. Um, so I think that 
to me, I think when we think about compositions and how weapons fit into compositions, I think oftentimes um, I, I wouldn't look at the op and be like, okay, well, like if they run a smokeless comp, I think they're going to be at a severe disadvantage. And I think that that's kind of like par for the course um, yeah. in the sense that if you, you know, if uh, probably not a, a great example because uh, the operator is something you could buy versus something you pick pre round. But yeah, if you pick, if they have an extremely heavy poke composition on league and you pick like little to no engage, then it's like, uh, oh, well, yeah, shit. we messed up, right? Uh, I think th there is obviously a difference there where it's like, oh, you couldn't have like foreseen that because they, they just buy, well, you could foresee it, but they could just buy the op at any given round that, you know, that, you know, it's like round four and then they'd like, oh, shit, he has an op, right? And I think part of that is like, we can maybe do some better messaging and maybe this is going into the weeds a little bit, right? We do, you know, give you money readouts at the start of round. And so maybe we should, maybe we could do something more to help say like, Hey, like be wary that there could be an op. I don't know if we need to go that hard mm -hmm. because we do give you the money, but I don't know if like people don't opt into it a lot because I do know people get surprised when people have ops, even though we do give you uh, money at the start of the round. Um, but anyway, sorry, that was a quick tangent to go to back to your point about compositions. I think that um, an op will, be disproportionately good against certain compositions than others, such as a no smoke composition or versus like a no smoke and flashless composition. I don't know when that would be the case, um, at least currently. But um, I do think that if you are opting into that, I think you you will you are opting into like an experience that you should understand is you know we're going to be tough. We're going to have a tough time against ops. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's generally. I think that's generally okay. Like as long as we give you the information that you are picking this, you are picking this comp this composition for a specific advantage, and you understand your disadvantages. I think it's totally fine um, to you know have these weapons that are like going to be way stronger against your comp versus uh, you know if you brought some other character. Yeah. Um, exactly. So yeah. did you ever think that like um, you saw the operator being strong, uh, you were thinking maybe it needs a nerf? Did you ever think that? Did you ever have ideas, rather, where you wanted to play test a specific composition, or maybe pitch ideas to character teams, or, or the, the development team for characters, or buffing or nerfing specific things on the, like, maybe map design, stuff like that? Does that go into your process, too, for deciding what part of a gun might need to change? You know, if a specific weapon is really strong on Ascent, but nowhere near as strong on Bind, do you kind of look at the weapon, or do you also try to start a, com a conversation about specific areas on the map design where your weapon might work better on one map, maybe too strong, or maybe it's too weak on another map because there's a lack of those areas, you know? Do you try to reach out to make sure that everything kind of fits in game-wide, or do you just hardcore focus on putting the gun in a place you want it before you do that? Yeah, I think for me, I definitely uh, kind of get the gun into a space I think is correct, but then I, you know, but I also make sure that my teammates know, and it's a bit, it's a big collaborative effort like i'll talk to sal and stuff like that um if there is like a map related uh function here like you know odin's on b or whatever on yeah. the ascent right um and see if like we know we're okay with those types of things and like generally speaking i personally find it kind of uh kind of cool that weapons have very distinct profiles on a given map uh, or on different maps um where it's like the odin is going to be much more prevalent on ascent because of this this spot right but it hasn't been I think too overpowered, at least as far as I could tell. Um, I totally I think agree that... with that. It's definitely good in a spot right now where it's very strong in its specific location, but you can just go to the other site and then the weapon on a retake will be very hard to use. You have to be really good at it to really warrant that risk. Yeah, and it's definitely a bit of a gamble if, you know, they end up, yeah, like you said, they end up not going B or like I use all this utility B to like get scans and try to pen them and like, oh, they didn't fucking come. Yeah. Uh, sorry, for, sorry for cursing. Oh, no, dude, trust uh, me. In... Cursing is all I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing is, like, uh, certain maps bringing out certain weapons just based on how they are configured is an interesting bit. And I think that's something that we definitely have some intentionality around, where it's like, you know, I think Split, you're not going to see as many Odins or things like that. And for, for example, even for myself, I don't like playing Sova on Split as much because you have such less options in terms of getting pen kills or yeah. getting like value scans uh, and things like that right um so i think that the map determining or helping shape decision making on weapons um same with like agents making decisions on weapons have been intentional um and they have like some band in which they might go too far potentially but i don't 
I haven't felt that we're like at that point yet. Um, and I think probably the closest, and in my own personal opinion, is probably close to like jet ops um, in terms of you know just being able to get out quickly. But I think that is her thing, and I do wonder. Um, I do think that like that could be that is frustrating, but I also think that's like a really cool uh, combination of weapon and character choice. Um, so that being said, like we definitely have. Um, a desire to keep those things and I think implement those things um, which is like character gun combinations or even map mapping gun combinations like I don't know let's say for like a dumb example we just make if there's a map that's like all glass like obviously Odin's are probably going to be a lot better and then <laughs> yeah. you could just start penning stuff right um, I think that like having having those sort of situ- having those sort of combinations uh, can help in making maps feel more distinct and give you provide you a different experience you know I definitely um, I agree for sure that especially it's nice that in a pretty short time in competitive Valorant there's already been clear cut player to weapon identities like you said and specific map to weapon identities as well where specific weapons are very common on one part of the map compared to another map that doesn't even use it at all where um you'll see shotguns in hookah you'll see you know ascent B you'll see the Odin stuff like that is that something that you kind of aim for when you make these changes do you envision that oh, this gun would be really good on this specific area of the map and it would kind of work out because it's not too good on the other side of the map, so retakes would be hard? Or is that just kind of something where, you know, you have the idea that, yeah, the Odin is high pin, so if I can see through walls, you kind of just loosely fit things together and have the community kind of figure out the rest? Or do you really, do you, do you try to envision these things so you can kind of fit these things? Oh, there's a new map that you might be playtesting. Do you really think about or maybe offer feedback about the map to make sure that you can get more of these interesting kind of crossovers of locations to weapons how they mesh together or do you just kind of do your thing about specifically the weapons and the rest kind of just happened over time naturally by the community yeah and i think i I do think um more more along the second one which is like we want the we have like loose ideas Mm -hmm. and like the maps are designed in a way that like and the maps and guns are designed in a way that they can complement each other but it's not like hard locked together not like locking um so and then we love or I personally love when a community when the community finds things out or like somebody figures something out and they feel really clever about doing it, um, versus like oh this is like obviously designed to be this way. Um, I think that's been a much more exciting uh, version of it, and I think that's what we would strive to do more so. Which is you know the maps and guns we collaborate and we'd be like oh you know these maps like they feel better for these types of guns and like that's just a cool happenstance. Mm-hmm. Oh, not just a happenstance, but it's like. We definitely like know that this is going to happen, but we don't want to like play into it so hard that's like, hey, everybody just like play this way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or like this is like one of the optimal ways to play, and like we're telling you, the developers are telling you that. I think that that's um, in my mind, that's been that that's sucks out a lot of the enjoyment and excitement of figuring something out, yeah. even if you're like, you know, the hundred thousand person into the party. If you don't know that, if you think you're the first one to figure it out, like that is such an exciting moment to do. Um, and I think that that's like that can be taken away or diminished if we make it too obvious that this is how it should be. Um, and I think, like, that being said, like, I think some are just really, some things can be really obvious in some cases. Like, uh, like you said, shotguns and hookah, it's like, yeah, you know, it's really tight choke. People got to come in. Like, this is probably just going to be a good idea, right? Yeah. But I think, like, you know, um, how, as we said, are these characters, the character and pro player identities have manifested. I think that people have come up with these really, you know, interesting ways of playing and that people are really excited to see like oh man like that that was so innovative what they've done and you know i think that part is really cool yeah um and so i think that we would strive to um not necessarily like hyper like sit down and could kind of contrive uh, or contrive a, a map to do that or have those sort of interactions but that we have it in our mind and that it's like this would be a cool thing to have and then if we if it is there make sure it's not too egregious or overpowered or you know X Y Z, and I think that that's how we would want to go about it. Um, at least in my mind, like when you ask this question, that's how I would want to, us to think about it and go about it, and have those have those combinations, um, but not make them so obvious. And I think that that would be a good place to have, good place to be in. So people can figure them out. People can feel clever about doing it. Uh, it could, you know, add to map diversity, weapon diversity, etc. Yeah, no, I like that for sure because especially so that. If something is played in optimal way and the developers come out and say, this is the optimal way to play it, if someone is playing unrated or just playing ranked and silver with their friends or there's random people in the team and that person isn't playing, how the developer said, yo, this spot of this map is played with this gun in the optimal way, 
then you know that has a lot of more consequences than just removing the excitement as well because when there's uh the developer of something that created something saying this is the way to play it if you don't want to play it that way you should be totally fine not playing it that way if you don't want to right and it definitely has a lot of yeah. more consequences long term for that i totally like that too that's really good yeah i mean do you think it's the same with um all these so the, I've, there's a lot of really cool wall bangs that probably aren't the most telegraphed that aren't very easy to spot that people have found a lot of really cool ones like how you can shoot through a specific pixel and bind hooker through the pipe into ct and stuff like that um do you ever try to communicate with the map developers regarding how specific weapons could be played in a site and like hey this map this site looks great uh we would open up more opportunities if this part of this map could have been of different material because the odin or Ares would play it this way right or do you really just do you, do you let them do their thing and kind of just let it develop over time and just play test it and, and try those things out for yourself or do you actually suggest things that might accommodate your weapons um i think i definitely uh can suggest those things and i'm a big fan of you know pen and i think that uh during like a lot of development um i played sova because i could you know do those yeah. sorts of things i figured those sorts of things out um uh for like er earlier on and so uh i would in terms of my feedback and you know, how I look at a map and like how the weapons are playing out. Um, I think I'd be more on the side of, hey, I think that this could open up XYZ space or like, um, or or vice versa. I can be like, hey, like, I know how the guns are going to pen through a type of material and stuff like that. Do you think, or like, I think if we made the material XYZ or like, this is what I think should happen because of, um, you know, there's not a lot of cover on site. Maybe you could change the material. There's not a lot of cover here. You know, I think it can go both ways where yeah. I think I'm advocating for more or less. Um, in certain situations where the pen is like in like weird pixel spots and it hits somewhere like really obscure, uh, I don't hate those sorts of things. I think they're probably kind of interesting or creative, but I don't know if they're done with as much intentionality. I think you'd have to get Sal on here to talk about oh, that. Oh yeah, no, there's um, a lot of ones I've definitely found that are for sure accidental. And there's some, I, I, I'm super sure he just had a really cheesy cool wall bang that he wanted to implement into the map that's very niche and just fits that specific corner um but it's in a risky position obviously i didn't want i didn't mean to ask you about specific map design and stuff but i wanted to you know if you think you can play that role and kind of making sure that everything fits together would you say you do the same with the character development where you know did you ever anticipate that jet would fit with the op really well because of that or maybe reina stuff like that or do you try to offer input or um ideas yeah yeah, I think in terms, I think uh, the great thing about uh, this team, um, and I guess just like even my time on League, is that it's always been a collaborative effort. And it's like you can speak and give your feedback about pretty much anything you're testing, right? Um, you just have to, you know, understand why it is the way it is and mm -hmm. what the goals are and try to speak to those goals. And I think, for example, of Jed and the Op, I think we've always had some idea that that would be like a really strong, um, a really strong combination. Um, but to the extent in which it is right now, I don't think I like could have foreseen. Oh, um, yeah, I, don't... I think we have different. Um... Oh, sorry, sorry to cut you off. There. No, 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 I definitely cut you off. No, I was just gonna say that Jet Off definitely probably couldn't have been foreseen to be as powerful and as cool as it ended up being because I think key players kind of just built that character up to heights that it probably surprised developers. I think. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of plays that are just mind blowing and competitive play already, and I definitely hope we'll see more. Which is why it's really nice hearing that. You know, all these things fit together, um, but they don't seem like they're too, like, oh, we want this character played in this exact way, right? You don't want your gun played in an exact way. So when someone finds a use for your weapon that you didn't completely anticipate, does that, like, is that exciting for you? Or is that kind of a, I don't, I don't want to, I think it's a, it's a bad way to say it, but do you feel like, oh, this guy's using the gun I designed in, in a way you didn't want him to? Or do you feel like, oh, I never thought of that, that's really cool? I'm not sure if your mic is muted right now. Hello? Hello? There you go. Sorry. Um, uh, I would say that, uh, sorry, I would err on the side of that, like, if they're playing in a different way, that that's pretty dope, because I don't think that, um, I think it, there are kind of some sort of boundaries, I would say, in, in terms of um, how... Uh, how far you can take it. And I think that that also comes down to just like how you do your due diligence. Like, uh, for example, um, let's say, you know, let's say somebody's got the judge, right? And like, you know, we give you a good amount of uh, spread or uh, accuracy increase when you crouch, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and let's say like people just start sniping with it or something like that and it's like it's actually effective i'd be like i don't even think it should be doing that right yeah, i mean it's kind of yeah, cool yeah. that you figured that out but i don't even think it should be doing that so i think that's something i would change versus like you know if uh somebody is uh figured out a way to you know use the odin in a, in a specific way or any weapon in a specific way and like i could look at it and be like oh that's pretty sick like i i i didn't think of that i'd be i'd err more on that um side of it versus like oh i made something and i want you to do it a specific way um or in x specific ways um i think that that's not necessarily a bad thing i think like you whenever you design something i think you have like uh ideas and intentions of where it will fit in how people would use it and sometimes those expectations get broken uh and i think that you expect that and i think that you have this sort of um internal dialogue with yourself and boundary setting of like what do you think is okay and like how is it manifesting in terms of uh, ways it could be counterplayed and ways that people are using it and like what kind of experience is it providing um like I'm not I'm not a character designer and but I understand that the goals of you know jet dash are like to be more escape heavy rather than combat heavy if mm-hmm. like um if if jet was taking like odin's or ops and just like like dashing and hitting you with her body and then fragging you like I think that that's like an unexpected way of how it's working and then I think you go back to drawing boards like oh I don't think it's supposed to even be working like that yeah yeah um so I definitely think like those situations can happen but yeah if a player surprises you i think it's more of a delight rather than like uh oh like why the hell are you doing that so a good example is when people started playing the bucky in early beta and they started playing it specifically to be able to use the right click to just shoot it through the thickest walls and glitch that that was a clear case of oh the bucky is definitely not supposed to pen through every single wall on the map with a right click um but sort of that strong identity of jet op and using it kind of aggressively for jump peeking though it it's cool uh it just needed some sort of adjustments to make sure that it fits the role and doesn't overwhelm the players yeah so i think the bucky thing was just like a bug that we yeah we obviously, needed to fix obviously versus a bug. Like, <laughs> yeah um yeah versus like i think jet jumpy gops and like dashing out is like a cool character combination oh sorry cool character combination and interaction right but i think it was getting into that uh breaking into that space of like this might be a little too much. I think it's more like, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, I think it's like a cool mix-up play to do, but it shouldn't be your best play to do all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's kind of the space we sort of landed in uh, with that in particular, because that was less a bug and more like, this is all intentional, but it's like, is it too far? Um, and so yeah, that's like, what that I, I, sense, I think yeah. is going on there with um, you know, with the character interactions. Like, hey, like they're using this gun and character in a way that like we might not have anticipated, but we think it's kind of cool. So let's do some things to help curb some more of the egregious situations, but make sure that it's like still a potential or still viable in mm-hmm. some way. Yeah, just to make sure that you put the gun in a spot where, how, so something was intended, but it was probably stronger than intended, right? So you just make sure you adjust it to the point where it's viable but not overwhelming, and the gun still plays along its identity while it has viability outside of that. You don't want it to be its main use, right? Yeah, I think it's like, yeah, I definitely think it's more of like a mix-up situation in terms of like, um, you know, I'm going to go for this play because I haven't done it in a while. Mm-hmm. Or like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's going to be optimal for maybe this angle for whatever reason that you've come up with as to why. Um, and I think that those moments can be really cool um, and can feel like, you know, you have different options and different um, uh, different ways of using your gun and making it more unique to you. Um at least in the moment. And so I think that that's like where uh, I would say that, you know, doing things that are like, quote unquote, like not intended um, can be, you know, can be cool. And we want to try to preserve some bits of that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are times when you, you probably have to pull the cord in some sense uh, on certain, on certain behaviors. Yeah. Um, and I think like, you know, we felt that a little bit with the jump, the jump land stuff where it's like, maybe it is just a little too, uh forgiving to jump land and like you know or like you know raise satchel like double boost land and like go immediately into a frag yeah um i think that that like this change will hopefully make it so it's a little less common but it could still be done and um you know it's a bit more thoughtful or intentional when you have done it versus like i should just do it every time because like i'm really hard to hit and once i land i'm like pretty yeah that makes perfect sense yeah i wanted to ask about um so you mentioned earlier there where Maybe yeah, the tangent you went on where you said that maybe you can give the users more information that someone might have an off. You know, you show the money right now, but maybe you wanted to show more information. 
Uh, does that include you thinking about, you know, very commonly suggested op scope sounds like compared to Counter Strike, you scope in there's a sound or, you know, uh, a, a laser dot like you have in the scope, but it's visible on the wall so you know where the op is posted or. TF2? Yeah, actually, exactly. TF2. Yeah, I didn't think of that either. Yeah, TF2. Um, do those kind of fit into that where you think that maybe if the gun would need it, you would maybe want to provide more information to the user that, oh, you're about to come up against an op? Or do you kind of want it to have that element of surprise? Or do you just want to find the perfect sweet spot? And how, how do you think you would go about doing that? Uh, so we've talked about this a lot internally, and I think my sort of assessment of it is that, like, I understand the desire or want of it, I think. I think the desire or want of, like, having a scope sound or a laser is, like, is an opt-in experience. Like, I want to know uh, an op is around the corner, and then I can make my tactical, like, strategic planning. Um, but I think... In a lot of cases, like an op sound, for example, uh, can run into some weird cases of unreliability slash you have to make the elements too gamey to then get it into a place where you want. So, for example, it's like, okay, if somebody's holding, like, if I, if somebody is just holding an op, the scope sound's not going to help at all because they, like, scope pre-round. And, like, I think I should already make the assumption with the money that they have um, that, they, like, an op should be here. And I should be using my utility to get that information rather than uh, inherently knowing that information, right? Yeah. And then... I think that uh, in other cases where they, they, I think people generally want that information. It's like, okay, I knew an op was playing C long. I used my utility and pushed them off, and now I've moved up. Now I want to hear them rescope. I think what's weird about that is that I think you should already intuit or, or like know that they probably are rescoped on a different angle because you pushed them off, and if you haven't killed them, for one. And then for two, I think that it makes the scope sound makes it really weird for the user in the sense that like they need to get they need to get. Uh, accustomed to and adjust like they're making sound when they scope at least now in valorant because you, you haven't played like that you haven't played with that mechanic whereas you might have in CSO. yeah um and i think that le lends to a lot of like weird behavior where the op the op will you know fall back off of the off of the site and then they'll rescope out of the scope range and then they'll just walk they'll like move scoped into uh like uh, an angle right which is obviously going to be worse given the other changes but i still think that's like something that could happen i feel like that information then becomes unreliable and then now you feel like the game is lying to you or not giving you enough information. um it's funny you're taking whereas, my exact arguments against op scope sound too because that's like word for word like that's exactly what i've said too or like well they're just gonna scope pre-round or they're just gonna scope out of the sound range and they're just gonna walk up with the scope in i think the only yeah. thing that a scope sound really actually hurts is clutch situations where if someone manages to clutch with an op anyway i think they pretty much deserve it if it's close range where someone would hear the op scope sound um, but it's interesting you said that, you know, Counter-Strike players definitely will have played with op scope sound, so they will be used to it. Um, do you really try to consider when you make these changes to a weapon, uh, do you consider, you know, obviously a lot of people probably are very familiar with playing Counter-Strike op, they know how it works, but when you make the changes, you really try to focus on these are Valorant players, and the people that ha don't have that prior experience, you don't want to make sure that they're left in a position where they're confused, right? You want to make sure that you treat your player base as valorant players rather than some have experience in other games some don't have that experience so make sure that you make sure that everyone can kind of have access to that weapon in the same way when it changes yeah i, I don't think I, i've not made any sort of like actual changes that i'll be like oh this will be like intuitive to cs players and yeah. not intuitive to others or vice versa where it's like this is better for um, valorant players versus you know uh you know siege players or xyz right um i do think it's something that you have in the back of your mind that's like more intuitive to a specific group but you're still trying to make something that is intuitive as best as possible to everyone um, versus, and I think it's like in an acceptable bound if like there are certain people with experience of other games that will pick up or acquire something faster. And I think that's just the nature of how like the gaming language, yeah. so to speak. It's like, if you play a lot more attack FPSs, you're probably going to get into a new, one, a new one or a new mechanic that is in the same vein faster than somebody else, even if you both play the same, play Valorant for a long time. Um, I think that's just the nature of it, but I definitely don't think that. Um, I definitely know that we're not. We don't do changes to be like, oh man, this would be sick for CS players. This would be sick for X Y Z. Like, oh, this is gonna be yeah. great for Apex players or something. You know, um, it's more like this is gonna be good for all players. Or it's like we need to hurt. You know, the efficacy of something at high level. This will definitely hurt the high level players. And not and, a, and like yeah. hopefully that's it. Yeah, you know, because I don't think um, we see too many people jump scoping in silver, but. Every angle taken offensively with an op was jump scope after jump scope, you know, to make sure that the gun will still be usable for everyone, regardless of history and skill level, uh, similarly, yeah. but make sure that, you know, I think this change, I think, I have to commend you because I think it's a really good change that will affect the higher level 
ranks uh, a lot heavier than the lower level ranks while making sure that everyone can still use the weapon. I think it's a super good first step. Um, so I, I wanted to ask one more thing about uh, specifically um, operators in terms of like, if you compare the operator to Counter-Strike, right? Uh, in CS, you can shoulder peek, the movement speed is very different, right? And obviously in this game, uh, something like movement speed ties into a lot of very in-depth things where netcode is probably closely tied to the pace of the game and how everything plays and stuff like that. Um, do you, did you, have you ever considered changing things like the strategy right now to bait an op shot if you don't have the utility is to do a jump jiggle with a knife out, right? Uh, did you ever think that changing something with the Vandal or Phantom or maybe specific only one of them to give the, it an identity more so that it has a, maybe a faster acceleration on its movement so you can shoulder peek an op similar to the Counter-Strike to kind of give it more of an offensive identity towards the operator or is this still the case where you know you want to make sure that you do that specific weapon in this case the operator and focus on that until you have it where you want it before you look at other changes yeah i think that um i think yeah i think when you focus you focus on the weapon and get it to where you want and i think you can start thinking about the counters that the weapon has or has or could have right um and a lot of times i think in a in a strictly weapon based matchup depending on the angle i think the operator is going to beat out a lot of a lot of guns and i think that that's by design, and yeah. especially if you're talking about long angles, right? Um, but yeah, whether you can swing, uh, like if you're at a close, or if you're at a close angle and you go wide on an op with you know your vandal or something, whether we wanted to make that more more or less viable by tuning specifics, uh, I can't say that we've thought of uh, as of at the moment. I think when we do like movement changes in general, we probably want to be generally holistic about it. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily always going to be the case, uh, given even like the scoped operator, for example. It's like the operator moves slower in scope, but the marshal. So yeah. it's like, I think that there's different identities that play there. And I wonder um, if, I think I wonder, like, it's an interesting uh, sort of proposition you have there, conundrum in the sense of like, hey, like movement can be the counter to this thing, but do you want the values of movement to be varying, or like more varying between the types of weapons? Like, uh, like oh, like let's say we wanted the Guardian to counter the op, right? It's like, should the Guardian swing faster while it's an ADS? Um, or like, or not, or like, should it move faster than the other rifles so you yeah. can like wide peak an op or something like that? And it's like, if that is the case, then it's like, does that like feel weird that we're in the same category of gun, but like moving faster, moving slower? Yeah, uh, I definitely I don't the quite, inconsistency so. would, would definitely be like concerning. Where if I play the Phantom, and then one map I I have an eco, I pick up a Vandal, and the Vandal just feels super different, right? That would be for some people, literally, especially for me, right? If everything just feels different, I would just be worse at the Vandal, right? And it would kind of put the players in a position where they have to kind of pick one. And yeah, you, that, that's, 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 that's definitely something like you, you, you would look to avoid that. You want that consistency to be there between all the higher price weapons to be the same and the SMGs to be the same. Yeah, I think I would want uh, as best as we can to be consistent across the board. Um, and we can break, I think you can break that consistency for certain things that make a lot of sense. And I think the case that makes a lot of sense to me uh, is, is the op first marshal. It's like the op is going to be a bit more lumbering and slow and things like that, but the marshal is like the marshals can be the marshal can be quick, and I uh, and I think that they are like disparate enough in identity to have to have that not be like a um, a weird thing for people. It's like oh, they're both a sniper, but I understand why one's a lot faster versus like Phantom and Vandal are both these rifles, these automatic rifles that have similar profiles. Why is one like much faster, one much slower than the other? I think that would be a bit more tougher of a pill to swallow. Um, so I don't think it's like necessarily awful, but as you pointed out, it's like inconsistency and things that seem similar enough, I think can be kind of like weirdly brain warping. And yeah, it's like, oh, you know, I'm going to go I pick up this thing and it's like, feels totally different. I could feel this movement. Speed, and it's like, I just feel like a slug. And even if it's like even minor, I feel like even I've seen minor changes feel like they have a big impact on a player. Oh yeah. Um, player. Told. Oh yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, I have one last question, and uh, yes, it's uh, I talk about this a lot, right? Where I, if I die to an op, I'm not usually very nice to them. In. I will have a comment ready <laughs> for I died to a you know an op crutch player or something. But that comes from I think personally, I think that right now when the op has been in its current state that it's been in, uh, it doesn't. It's like if you're good with the vandal and you, you perform really well with the Vandal, you've practiced that gun and gotten very skilled at it, you have learned the recoil, you've learned how to use it, you know, you've learned the efficient rate just to uh, use it at, right? 
for the operator, do you ever think about changing things like where the sort of effectiveness the operator can have in the game and how dominant that performance can be doesn't really correlate as heavily compared to other weapons with how much skill you need to use the weapon to have that same impact, right? If you have a high impact on Vandal, you need a good amount of skill. But to have a high impact on Operator, it's a lot more straightforward and very like self-running in terms of like where you put your crosser in the right place, you'll eventually get a kill, right? Do you ever consider those specific things in terms of how much skill you should need for a weapon to be useful or how much skill you need you should need for a weapon to perform to a certain level, right? Obviously, I think you, of course, you think about those things. You can't just go around and make the Odin body one shot everything. You give it an uncontrollable recoil, but specifically for the weapons that are a lot more straightforward to use, you know, the shorty, the judge, uh, the bucky, those, those very straightforward, this is a shotgun, this is a sniper, the way you use them, did you ever consider changing the skill requirement for its performance in some way with these changes? Or, you know, once again, is this more of a, you take this step to make sure the gun is in the place where you want it before you look too much into it and you take your time to make sure you put it in the perfect place? Yeah, I think that with these changes, there's a minor um, uh, sort of look at where skills should be more impactful. Or, I wouldn't say minor, kind of moderate in the sense that, like, your movement's going to be more important. So, not even just the jumping, but, like, the dead zone stuff. is You'll get an accurate sooner and accurate slower. So, like, how you move and peak is going to feel is going to feel a bit different. I hope people will... Uh, I know people are going to have to adjust to yeah, I think it's the right way to go. But I definitely think it makes it a bit more skillful in like who can access this and who can access it sooner than others. Uh, and then I think that the other thing is, um, it's a minor one, and I thought it was kind of low hanging fruit, but I think it kind of hits into the range of skill, uh, which is the leg shot damage reduced, and you can't kill light armor anymore. I think that just encourages you to not hit leg and like be pre aimed better. And like, it, and if you even if you hit like a, a jump knife jiggler in the leg and they had light armor, but they were like low on cash. You're not gonna. I think that that encourages you to have better, uh, like a bit better accuracy. And like, I think generally speaking, we probably can agree that like the uh, the op um, the op accuracy in probably almost any game is like can be reduced down to like that simple. Like I just pointed it in the right place um, because the gun is not gonna have like perfect accuracy, or the gun the guns generally do have perfect accuracy for the most part. Um, so I think that we would like to inject when we can where it makes sense of more you know reward for skillful skillful play um i just feel like with the operator in general like i think most people feel it's not skillful that you just point a click somewhere um so i think i'm hoping that with like different ways of moving or like certain moving methods not as good that an op feels a bit more like oh this guy's playing better rather than crutch um, but that being said, like I don't know if I, we, I have other ideas on how you can make it like more skillful, but I just don't know if that's uh, something that we would do. I think we're more focused on getting this version of the weapon that we have into the spot we wanted to. Um, then you know, to me, I don't know. Basically, I'll say like never say never, but like I don't know if like we're gonna make you know big sweeping updates to this gun or like. You know, yeah. Or do grand grand changes or reworks or things like that. I'm not sure yet, but um, to me, I like have thought about those sorts of, things. and I don't know exactly what we're gonna do. But for for this version, sometimes skill comes into play. Other times, it's like, hey, this is like the case of the weapon being used at probably any MMO that we probably want it. In this case is awesome. Awesome. I think by virtue of nerfing some pieces of it, you are making it more skillful and. and uh... Oh yeah, no, I definitely I I like the changes for sure because they they definitely do fit into that. I uh, definitely wanted to know if you consider it for the weapons, but I mean, obviously you think of everything. So, Nick, with well, a five head, you know every lineup on the game. You know, do you smile when people dink for one forty five with the sheriff across the map? Does does that misery um, they feel make you feel happy? <laughs> no, actually, funny enough, uh, a long time ago, I, I wanted it to leave, you know, one shot at kill, but. Uh, I, I, I wanted that thing, and this is before I be I became a um for the weapons, and uh, I was told I thought really reasonable reasons as to why I was not, and uh, have now been converted. Five, and so while I don't necessarily smile about the one forty five, <laughs> uh, I definitely can look at it and be like, yeah, I understand why it is. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, it's like that. 
Because <laughs> I've, I've certainly been hit by the 145s. Yeah, you know, I've been like... saved by the 145s, and then I'm happy. But when I get them, I feel sad. You know, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You hit a nice, you hit a nice shot across the way, like across sea long. You're yeah. like, oh well, all right. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I definitely get. This yeah. is great, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for taking your time, man. That was fun. Good yeah. Chat. I hope you guys like this. I definitely took the time to make sure I discussed, you know, with my chat. I brought up a bunch of ideas from you guys, a bunch of questions. And I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's actually my first time really hosting kind of like a an interview or whatever you want to call it with a developer. And I hope uh, I did. I hope I did an enjoyable job. And uh, I hope I don't have to play any more ops and ranked. Awesome. So try to my Twitch channel. Peace, guys. Make sure you subscribe and leave a like if you like the video.